And uh, thank you again. Of course. So, all right, great. Thank you for joining us at Bridging Minds, everyone out there. We have um, Professor David Price with us, and he's an anthropologist at Evergreen State College. Uh, he's been trained at the University of Chicago and the University of Florida, and he's a professor of anthropology at St. Martin's University. And uh, Dr. Price has written an amazing book, Weaponizing Anthropology, Social Science in Service of the Militarized State, as well as a number of other books uh, looking at the history of how academic knowledge production has been used by the military uh, and uh, intelligence agencies and the American state, including Cold War Deceptions, the Asia Foundation, the CIA, which is uh, Dr. Price's latest book, and the American Surveillance State, How the U.S. Spies and Dissent, which was published in 2022, and numerous other books. Uh, Dr. Price is a frequent contributor to Counterpunch, which is actually, full disclosure, how I encountered your work, sir. Um, I'm a long reader of Counterpunch. I found it to be an amazing site, and I've, I've been it for over 20 years. And uh, with that, you know, please, if you're listening to this out there, if you like what you hear and see, push the proverbial like button and subscribe. And by all means, please share this interview with anyone you come across. So with that said, uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Price. Uh, thank you, Kamal. It's really great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. It's, it's an honor. And so um, the, the title of your book, Weaponizing Anthropology, like I found it to be really evocative, you know, because it I mean, conjures the notion of um, the deliberate use by the military, by a state of an academic discipline. But there's, I'm sure there's many people out there for whom that the trope, the idea might be a little new. So if, if you don't mind, if, if I could ask you, would you mind explaining the term weaponizing anthropology, what you intended by it, and the book itself, or your, your intention in writing it, and what it explores? Yeah, the term the term weaponizing, um, which I think has become a bit more common uh, in American English. You hear you hear people in the news and stuff talking about uh, things being weaponized. Uh, I I first started playing around with it maybe fifteen years ago in a joking sort of way. Um, you know, I was hanging out with a friend and we would say, you know, let's let's weaponize that that pizza. Let's weaponize whatever. Uh, and at the same time, this was an era where the Pentagon was increasingly trying to get anthropologists to contribute to their war on terror. And so they were, uh, you know, in the in the late zeros, uh, the late aughts uh, and the early teens, this was really a period uh, in the terror wars where there was this excuse being made that if if the American military could be smarter and more culturally sensitive that, you know, they will welcome us as liberators with sort of, with sort of this idea. Uh, and anthropology has a long history, um, both with successes and failures. I think a lot of failures of contributing to various different military efforts. And so in the, the terror wars, you know, post post nine 11 terror wars in the United States, uh, there was this real push to try and get, American anthropologists or American social scientists from other disciplines to take their knowledge of culture, of specifically Middle Eastern cultures or Islamic culture, uh, and to use as a weapon this knowledge of, for this colonial project that was that was going on uh, and, and is going on. Um, and so during, during this period, uh, most of the chapters, or many of the chapters, maybe half of the chapters in that book, Weaponizing Anthropology, were some version of them appeared in Counterpunch, where I had uh, a lot of freedom, thanks to the editors, Alexander Coburn and Jeffrey St. Clair, um, to really explore very critically um, what was going on. And it was a time where I was able to access a lot of documents showing how the military had these dreams of 
using cultural knowledge um, to, to captivate these, these foreign audiences. I see it. I mean, that's, that's fascinating. Um, so this kind of, to me, it evokes the whole um, Cold War, Vietnam War era notion of quote unquote, capturing um, hearts and minds, um, you know, psychological operations to try to, you know, win the uh, consent um, to occupation from uh, natives and with what you're describing, uh, it's the same. Yeah, very, very much uh, part of the same project. I mean, all of this falls under the heading of counterinsurgency, right? Which in military jargon is often called coin um, for, for short. Uh, but it's the idea that you can suppress uprisings, you can get people on your side, um, both by using force and by using cultural knowledge, as you say, the hearts and minds, which was really the, the project uh, or the phraseology that was used during the Vietnam War, uh, we started having a lot of this same, this same sort of um, ideas. And you know, in, included in this was General Petraeus, um, who was in you know, very influential command position, was really pushing this new counterinsurgency manual uh, that drew very heavily in ways acknowledged and not acknowledged on anthropological literature and sociological literature. Uh, and it was really this sort of engineering dream that, um, you know, people in a country who were being invaded could somehow um, go along with this invasion if the right sort of cultural magic words or practices were put in place. Uh, and, you know, and much of this is, is patently absurd. Um, I don't really know if people in the military thought it would work, but I do know that they thought this would be one way to get the American public that was, uh, you know, very skeptical uh, at various phases, certainly before uh, Americans of, uh, you know, went into Iraq in, in March, 2003, there were a great deal amount of protests that were out there. And of, of course, uh, there was lots of skepticism about uh, whether there could ever be victory in Afghanistan. And of course we know after 20 years there, there wasn't. Um, but, but there was this part of, part of this counterinsurgency push was to try and convince the American public that someone had a smart idea on uh, you know how to how to win these these losing wars that that were out there hmm. so from what you say it sounds as if I mean a, if a, if a ser it sounds as if a serious motive to these kind of projects was actually, Maybe not even as much winning the hearts and minds of um, the people being occupied um, within these uh, theaters of war, but really back home, selling, pitching the idea to the American public. Yeah, I would say it was a, a two front battle that, you know, these claims of, uh, you know, using brilliant cultural or nuanced cultural techniques uh, could somehow uh, win the war. But uh, and and there are of course you know cultural things you can do you can be more sensitive in all sorts of ways but it's again it's not going to fool someone into thinking their country is not being invaded or or things like that and you know there were these uh, you know there were these public pitches of things like you know in in many Middle Eastern countries showing someone the bottom of your foot is you know, not it's it's a rude thing to do, or touching someone with your left hand and and things like this. And you know, I've I've lived in the Middle East. It's true; these are best practices. But uh, it's not that <laughs> it's not that being polite to someone while you're invading their country is going to make them somehow think uh, that everything's okay uh, while while it's out there. And that was very much part of the pitch: is that if we if we did this properly, it could work. Hmm. So the, there's there's a phrase I've come across in, in my own you know, reading up on these subjects, and as that of mapping the human terrain, human mm -hmm. terrain, you know, thing. Um, and I've read a few yeah, interesting. I've read a few interesting books about psychological warfare. There's a uh, the late Colonel 
Michael Aquino, he had a, like, toward the end of his life, he published a couple of interesting books uh, about mine war, fine far. Um, and I think he was involved in um, psychological operations during the Vietnam War. And then there's um, you know, th there's some interesting manuals that, that I've that, that I've seen published by the Department of Defense, and then some interesting academic research, like Christopher Simpson's um, book on uh, communication studies, which was heavily situated. You know, the, the book's focus was in the Cold War era, and it seems as if the the, the term human terrain and human terrain mapping, you know, more than these, you know, some of these other older terms. And it seems to kind of give a very, a very spatial um, feel. You know, there, there's this idea you have terrain, this terrain to conquer. You, you have operations in terrain. Well, you know, you have the ground itself, but then you have people. And it, to some degree, it's, it strikes me as a little um, dehumanizing. But um, mapping the human terrain, how, how does this, how does this concept come out of? Uh, those weaponized cliche anthropology. Yeah, around uh, 2006, 2007, uh, there was a, a program, and it was it was the idea is it was called the Human Terrain Systems um, (HTS) or uh, HTT, the Human Terrain Teams. And the dream was that you could train and embed social scientists downrange. Um, with U.S. troops in Afghanistan, in Iraq, or wherever the theater of war was. And the, the claim was that these would be culturally competent people who understood cultural nuance, so they could read situations. And the pitch to the public was that this would decrease lethal engagements, that if you had someone uh, you know, who knew what was going on they could tell everybody to just chill out, and not you know, not have uh, needless firing on civilians or or others. And the the idea was that they would get these anthropologists or people from other disciplines who had linguistic competence for the theater that they were in and cultural competence, and then they would embed. And uh, there was a this was a very expensive program. Uh, by my count, it's the most expensive anthropological project, if it's anthropology, I don't really think it is, that, that, anyone's, that anyone's come up with. Uh, and it never really worked. Uh, they had great difficulty recruiting anthropologists, in, in part because myself and others helped organize anthropologists to resist this. We formed a group called Network of Concerned Anthropologists uh, that got other anthropologists to take a pledge that they would not join counterinsurgency operations, such as such as human terrain. Um, so they couldn't get people who really had the linguistic knowledge, mostly. Um, they reached out to other disciplines. They were able to get some people. None of it, none of it really worked. But one of the one of the more troubling parts of of human terrain is, Many of their scenarios that they would publicly talk about were that you would have this human terrain team leader that would be embedded with a, a, you know, troops downrange and they would say enter a village. And then this person would help, they would always say reduce harm, but they would always help identify groups which were not problematic or groups that they thought were not violent or groups that they thought were not with fighters, which is of course a form of targeting. If I enter a village and I say everybody over here uh, on this side is okay, um, that's you're using social science in some sense to help target uh, individuals. This, they of course denied that this is this is what was was going on. So, you know, human train lasted a couple of years. It was, uh, there was a fortune spent on it in training and implementing. They had these very strange sort of uh, uh, supposed AI translators that they brought to the field that they would use. I mean, it was, it was you know, the dream was that it was like a, a Star Trek universal translator or something like this. And they're called phrasalators uh, that they brought out, but they never worked. Uh, there was technology where supposedly they were supposed to have uh, be able to use satellite technology to instantly get information uh, from 
you know, people sitting at desks in the United States. And the technology didn't work. Even when it did, it didn't really provide this sort of information. And this is what I found really troubling um, ethically, right? As an anthropologist, I'm very interested in doing ethical engagements with others, uh, ethical research. Um, it, it troubled me morally, and it really troubled me politically, which, uh, you know, all three of those together. And so, you know, a lot of my writing is full on political writing, talking about the political implications of this sort of neo-colonial project. Uh, but I've also been very involved in disciplinary ethics. I served on a, a committee in the American Anthropological Association while all this was going on, where we rewrote the ethics code to, in part, strengthen uh, some of the language about not doing secret research, research that people who are studied can't can't access. I see. That's fascinating. Uh, it's fascinating and disturbing. Um, but it is refreshing to to hear that there are you know that there is resistance and that there are sites of resistance within uh, academia um, resisting the uh, I mean it sounds like abuse to me the the abuse of academic resources and personnel um, so it's that I am curious um are there antecedents to this use of anthropologist and embedding actual like scholars and researchers within the field in theaters of conflict uh, are there antecedents to this and you know during the first gulf war or prior to that in the cold war uh definitely um you know during if you just go back to the second world war uh probably about half of America's anthropologists were in some way directly involved in the war effort. They were in the OSS, uh, the predecessor organization to the Central Intelligence Agency, um, and a, a whole variety of um, intelligence agencies that, that don't exist anymore. They did everything from uh, working for the War Relocation Authority, the organization that locked up Japanese American citizens uh, in camps. And, you know, about, by, by my, re I, I got sidetracked and wrote a whole book on this, trying to figure, figure out this, you know, what, where all this stuff had come from. Your antecedent question is very important to me. Like, how, how is this linked to anthropology? And even with these anthropologists who worked in these, um, concentration camps, the war relocation authority camps. Uh, by my own personal reading, uh, about half of them were doing sort of heroic, gallant work of using their position to fight the internment of these people. And then there were half of them that by my own personal judgment, I think did some pretty horrible stuff in terms of working, uh, you know, working harder to intern these people. Um, the, who I believe were interned un, un, unjustly. Um, but there were anthropologists who worked for that agency that, that really got beat up bureaucratically because they spent all their time um, trying to have the rights restored uh, for these people who were who were locked up. Uh, and, and so there were anthropologists in the Second World War that were full on spies. Um, they, there are a lot of anthropologists had uh, linguistic knowledge of areas that were suddenly battle front, fronts, whether that was in North Africa uh, or, or anywhere in Europe or all over Asia. Uh, and they did a whole variety of, of things. Sometimes they were language trainers. Um, I did find some instances where there was full on secret agent work where uh, anthropologists went and uh, did this. Uh, they helped They helped design uh, uprisings, you know, insurgencies in like areas where the Japanese uh, were uh, occupying people in Burma and elsewhere. Uh, they would they would use their cultural knowledge to come in and and uh, try and get people to to resist. And there were instances where they were doing counterinsurgency. and mm. and I found instances, um, one sort of famous instance, of anthropologists who'd been very good at doing this during the war, who after the war sort of had second thoughts. One where Gregory Bateson, a uh, very famous anthropologist, uh, had worked for the OSS. He had worked on doing 
uh, what are called black propaganda operations. A black propaganda is where you pretend that you're the enemy and maybe 80% of what you say is true and 20%, you know, is not true. I mean, you're talking about Christopher Simpson and, you know, this book of his about Laswell and stuff. This is, these are the people who invented this. Um, and uh, Bateson had been very successful doing this during the war and he had, you know, really gotten into it. And, you know, I, I'm anti-fascist. I could, <laughs> I could get into some good anti-fascist war. Um, and, but after the war, um, I found at the Library of Congress in uh, Margaret Mead, his, he was married to Margaret Mead, uh, and he wrote her letters after the war where he was devastated and, and said, maybe we shouldn't have done all this. You know, maybe our job is not to use anthropology for harm, which in some sense it is. I mean, he didn't think of it as harm at the time. He thought it is winning the war and, you know, stop, stopping uh, all of these threats that were out there. But yeah, there's a long history of using all sorts of social science um, in, in warfare. Um, and to me, again, there are large political issues. There are large uh, ethical issues. And I think during wartime, people push all those concerns aside and don't, don't really think through those issues necessarily. Some people. Yeah. It's, uh, I've always found Gregory Bateson to be a really fascinating uh, figure, actually. Um, and when I did, when I first came across, when I, when I first realized that he had um, intelligence work, that, that, that question is like just mind blowing. I'm like, oh, this is cool. This is interesting. You know, then you look at this whole nexus of very erudite, like very scholarly people who were picked up by the old sense. And, and what you say, it makes sense if you have a context of total war, you have a state engagement in total warfare, and there's this idea of using all of his resources um, to that effect. Unfortunately, you mentioned the, these ethical implications, which I think are absolutely grave. It's it's interesting. There's um, so I think it's interesting how some of these themes trickle into pop culture, like in, in their strangest ways. Like take the Indiana Jones film franchise. You know, Professor Jones. He's an he's an archaeologist, and and, and interesting enough, within Raiders of the Lost Ark. There are these scenes, and it's my favorite film when I was a kid. But his his college lectures struck me as more actually. He's lecturing more about actually anthropology, you know. So like when they film him in class, he's you know he's discussing material that's equally you know cultural anthropology, just you know as archaeology. But um, in later films, it's interesting they do toy with this idea of him doing wartime intelligence work and it's you know in the very last one which wasn't forgettable but it wasn't a piece of the films in the series uh he and another professor are captured by germans and they are skulking about in germany at the end of world war ii and the seeking relics but it's this sort of weak this notion it's okay well yes this is a pop culture exploration or admission to this idea, this theme that there really were academicians who were utilized um, in the war effort. And it's, it's, in, I think in, uh, is there, one of the first instances of anthropologists um, being caught or being identified as being spies uh, were archaeologists. Uh, at the end of the First World War, um, Franz Boas, very famous American anthropologist, German-American anthropologist, who's a professor at Columbia University, uh, condemned, he wrote a letter to the, the magazine, The Nation, uh, in, in 1919, not saying the names of, but saying there were four archaeologists who had spied uh, for the Naval Department during the Second World War, and that he'd learned about this during the war and did not want to risk their lives by identifying them during the war. So he would wait till afterwards. And he, he uh, says they quote prostituted science by going out and, uh, and doing this. 
Uh, and for doing this, for, for Boaz writing this, uh, weeks later, he became censured. He became the first, <laughs> and as far as I know, only American anthropologists ever to be censured by the American Anthropological Association. Uh, and years later, in the, uh, well, in the year 2000, I'd figured out who the four archaeologists were and <laughs> wrote, a, wrote an article. Uh, you know, for the nation, explaining like exactly what he, they had done. And, um, you know, what they had done is they'd gone to uh, Central America and uh, or the Yucatan Peninsula, and there were real concerns that German U-boats were going to invade the United States. I mean, it didn't happen, but, you know, during the war, nobody knew maybe the war was going to come here. And so these four archaeologists, all from Harvard, traveled around and did little bit of archaeology, but every day they, or, or very regularly, they had a portable uh, ham radio, a uh, shortwave radio set up that they could broadcast, nope, we haven't seen any submarines, and from, from where they were. So they did this throughout the war. And, you know, Boaz, he thought, you know, it, it endangers everyone if people are doing this, which is true. If people start getting caught doing this sort of thing, no one is going to trust any scientist when when they're abroad doing these things. And of course, we now know there are lots of instances um, of, uh, you know, fake people pretending to be scientists. I mean, the one of the ways that they, uh, you know, they, they caught, they identified where uh, Osama bin Laden was uh, was they, there was a vaccination program that was going around vaccinating people, but uh, taking DNA samples while they were doing it. And when the news when of the this, news yeah, pardon? Yeah, and, and, and when news of this got out, uh, people didn't want to get vaccinated. I mean, there are big consequences for 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 doing this this sort of stuff. So. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a long history, and, and you know, and archaeologists are are really uh, there's a history, not just Indiana Jones, but there in in real life, um, there have been several. I found many instances of anthropologists or archaeologists that were out uh, in the backcountry of places. You know, they speak the local language. They can kind of. It's not that they're not going to stand out as foreigners, but they have an excuse to be there. Uh, and I had a professor when I was a undergraduate, uh, Mark Papworth, who had worked in Nubia, uh, in Northern Sudan on a UNESCO project in the late fifties, early sixties that involved, that was, uh, when they were raising, building the Aswan dam on the Nile, the river was going to come, it came up and flooded all these archeology span sites. And he was there doing up river work in Nubia. Uh, and he was asked to, by someone in probably military intelligence, uh, to keep a little notebook on the types of military hardware he saw, just, you know, while he was really doing his work, his primary work really was doing archaeology. But if you see things, let us know. And um, yeah, so for my work, I've interviewed dozens and dozens of older anthropologists and trying to and ask them questions about were you ever asked to do this sort of thing and i found lots of instances where people say oh we just thought it was normal in the 50s and 60s to do this which is fascinating you know it's actually I, P. E. lawrence the famous lawrence of arabia he was an archaeologist and i yeah. I, I recall reading that his um i think his very first dig his very you know there's his initial, you know, field work was actually, you know, he was there. Were, there was a real dig, but there was a military intelligence component as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it's fascinating history. I, I'm curious. Um, as you've interviewed older colleagues and mentors and, and people within the field, um, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that. This, for some of them, they, it, there was this kind of attitude of, well, we, we didn't know any better, that we thought that's just how it works. I, I was wondering if you could explore that a little bit more about the, the assumptions that many scholars have concerning um, doing work for the government and how, you know, wh whether or not there are peculiar aspects to the Cold War culture, or times, 
whether there was just kind of a, 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 a disciplinary naivete, what your feeling was as you engaged these people? Yeah, there's that's a that's a great question. Um, in part because so many anthropologists had been involved in the war effort with World War II, and it was a different war than the Cold War. I mean, fighting fascism is very different than, I don't know, projects of empire or neo-colonialism or, you know, all of all of the things that wind up with the Cold War. And I did find, um, especially in archives, uh, I found really good records of older anthropologists who had been around during the 1950s when they would be working, I mean, this is this goes back to Indiana Jones, I suppose. They would be, you know, working in the classroom and stuff. They get out of class and there are these people in suits waiting to talk to them. Uh, they go in their office and they would ask some questions. Oh, this last summer you were uh, in Iran. Uh, what did you see? Who do you know? All of these sorts of things, you know, that it would be a very common thing. And people didn't really think anything about it because... Uh, if they'd been in the OSS during World War II, uh, they had those sort of connections. They knew not to sort of freak out when these people uh, came and talked to them. They thought of it as normal, especially during the 50s, uh, because this American project of empire was not quite as apparent to everyone, right? It was growing. It was starting. Um you know, we were still the people who'd fought the Nazis in people's mind and, and all of this sort of stuff. So there was a great willingness in the 1950s. And this really changes in the 60s, especially um, uh, even after 1960, 1963, there's a, a project where the government tries to get American anthropologists to work on counterinsurgency projects uh, in South America, Central and South America. And even anthropologists who'd worked for military and intelligence agencies in the Second World War say, no, 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 this isn't what we're supposed to do. Um, we're supposed to, uh, we're not supposed to betray the people we study, right? We're not supposed to make them vulnerable or visible or all of these sorts of things. So there is this Cold War moment in the late 40s throughout the 1950s where people didn't really think about it in those sorts of terms. But uh, by the time you get to the 60s, um, and of course, there's a whole range of anthropologists, right? There are some who continue to do it, some who don't, but there's much more vocal and maybe a majority opposition by the time you get to the mid-1960s of doing this sort of work. That's interesting. That's fascinating. And I, have, you, um, have you found in, you know, you, working with your with colleagues more of your age do you think have you found that there's more awareness of um that there's just kind of more more awareness of the ethical uh boundaries that this kind of weaponized approach to anthropology can create or is it you know, maybe some people for some people yes some people no yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's a whole range. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because colleagues my age and, you know, I'm old, I'm at retirement age, right? Um, so colleagues my age grew up through a period, I think, where there was much more awareness and criticism of the CIA. People were very critical of the CIA being on campus and things like that. Uh, you know, I was a, I was a university student uh, in the late 70s and, and or, you know, and the 80s. Uh, but once you get past 2001 in the United States, after 9-11, um, there's really a memory flush that goes on. Uh, there's so much pro-CIA, so much Homeland Security, uh, people's resistance to things like surveillance. I mean, all of these sorts of things. There's a real cultural shift that that happens during this fear wave that that happens after 9/11. And so, while uh, you know a, a younger than me generation, uh, there are lots of people who are critical uh, that are that are out there. I don't think the criticism is quite as uniform as it used to be. I think there's. Uh, I think the fear wave that came with 9-11 uh, 
launched this different sort of friendliness to academics getting involved in intelligence work. Um, that that was that was a very crucial a very crucial sort of moment. That makes a lot of sense, and it's and it's it's interesting. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I can see how you know. Just thinking about how you know, and using a term like jingoistic, maybe a little judgmental, but I do. I did find it really interesting. Like you know, for example, like many people whom I knew who were a little left, who are liberal, kind of central, centrist kind of liberal, or you know, kind of like center right, center left, or a little bit. Many left bit left of that. Around the time of nine eleven, a lot of people I knew. And I was I was in university at the time, um, two thousand two thousand one. A lot of people I knew who just yeah, just overnight they really became very hawkish, um, and it seemed like there's this mood that went across the culture. And that's actually one of the reasons I really start reading Counterpunch a lot because I, I found it kind of an, an oasis of sanity. You know, just struggling to find, you know, the internet was, though the web was still young and just kind of finding, you know, sources that had a critical perspective that, you know, I, that I could engage. It was really difficult. The news just became very jingoistic and very, you know, rigid <laughs> yeah but uh yeah i mean there there was a wave of islamophobia that i mean it's it's still there uh i don't know that the wave is crashing as hard as it was uh in in 2001 and 2 but it 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 set america off on a real strange trajectory and part of that trajectory was a willingness to accept a massive growth in in intelligence agencies uh, here here in the U.S. The sprawling of military intelligence and the NSA's power. Um, you know, when you think about the sort of revelations that um, Snowden did in terms of uh, the extent of uh, you know monitoring all the time that's there. If that had happened, I don't know, 15 years earlier, I think the government would have fallen. Uh, but instead, we we had become numb. I mean, I, I wrote a piece called the the Social History of Wiretaps that sort of chronicles, uh, and it's something I wrote for for counter, Counterpunch, and then reworked it in the surveillance book I did. But it it just sort of looks at these different waymarks where you can look at American public opinion about should the police be allowed to do wiretaps even of criminals. Uh, and the majority of the American public in the uh, you know 1930s thought absolutely not. Even criminals should not. Uh, there should not be wiretaps that are out there. And then you you fast forward to Snowden just saying, well, our metadata is being collected and processed at all times, and retroactively they can uh, they can find conversations because everything is being recorded out there. And we all were stunned for a few minutes, and then switched over you know to watch some reality tv show and and forget about it <laughs> american ninja or something like that yes yeah. well of course All right <laughs> Wait, what else better what we have to watch that's right <laughs> it's um I, i'm i'm curious uh well it would almost strike me you know this this is might be going a little bit beyond you know what actual evidence would suggest but just Intuitively, I get a feel. I always, I, I almost wonder if anthropological research being done in the American public itself may have been applied to that particular moment, as far as um, as far like Laswell. You know, think, thinking about thinking about people like Laswell, or thinking about people like uh. Bernays or Lippmann. Yeah. Christopher Simpson's book was a real new opinion for me. I mean, first read it, it was like 98, 99 when I read it, and it just so blew my mind. And thinking about Noam Chomsky's, um, you know, like, you know saying the statements over the years and you know, re regarding the use of propaganda in 
um, almost regimenting American views and, and manufacturing consent to the project of empire. And it would seem to be a very sensible thing if they were in the establishment. You know, there are reasons to want American hegemony. There's 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 market based reasons. There's there's a whole host of cultural and economic reasons why you know one would want America to be team number one. So if that were the case, why not utilize um, everything in the book? And I, you know, I have I have no way of knowing, but it, I would be very surprised if the academic research hasn't been utilized as far as um, finding approaches to sell these kind of projects to the American public. Yeah, research on yeah. us. Ab absolutely, yeah. There's a there was a a great very short piece that Chomsky wrote on 9 12 2001 and it showed up on counterpunch in very various places but it's it's probably 750 words or something very short but in there you know and and no one knew who made these attacks right for or who was going to get blamed for days right it's not like right away al-qaeda gets gets fingered on this and so he opens he says look we don't know who did this um, it's a horrible thing. This many people getting killed is a horrible thing. But here's what we do know. We do know that the right is going that, you know, the Bush presidency, which had been failing. I mean, he'd been just barely you know, making it along, uh, is going to use this and they're going to use it to increase surveillance. They're going to use it to attack, you know, the political left. They're going to use it for all these sort of things that happened. And uh, you know, it, it makes me think of that Naomi Klein book about disaster capitalism, the, the shock doctrine, right, where you you have this big event. And and that is social science, right? Those she's she's drawing on these University of Chicago economists who who really came up with this method of shock and awe that uh, you have this big disaster and the rules are off. You can you can do whatever you want uh, while people are just just sort of standing there in a daze. and. That's what happened with the Patriot Act. That's what happened with, which still, I don't know where that came from. I, you know, I've talked to scholars who spent a long time trying to figure out where this massive document that had already been written, obviously, and the people who voted on it hadn't, hadn't, you know, read uh, just weeks after this. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a good deal of social science that's going into that. These are smart people who've, who've had great undergraduate educations, including uh, the liberal arts and social sciences uh, and law degrees and all this. Um, and they're waiting. <laughs> they're waiting for this gift, as Chomsky called it, you know, a gift to right forces that were there. Hmm. It's, um, oh, you know, you have this gift. Why not use it? At the appropriate time. And it's like, oh, no, we're waiting, waiting, waiting. Here it is. And the Patriot Act was very strange. It's big doorstopper <laughs> legislation. It just pops up. And it's um and it's just remarkable. Like I I remember the the, the mood, the cultural mood in the nineties, that it was it was a little darker, more critical of the government, more critical of the establishment, kind of coming out from a sort of post-Cold War disillusionment. You had TV shows like The X-Files and Millennium. And um, it seems as if overnight, like literally o overnight, within, you know, within a few months, the entirety of um, American punk culture became you know, changed. The, the entire mood changed. And it's it's fascinating uh, how quickly that seems to have happened. Um, yeah. So, yeah. You mentioned your, your, your book, you make reference to your book on surveillance. That was, that was the American surveillance state, how the U.S. spies on the scent. Is that the one that you're referring to? Or the Cold War? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, 
Uh, you know, the first several chapters, uh, you know, I have things like the social history of wiretap, uh, uh, sort of critical look at J. Edgar Hoover and how powerful he was and sort of the surveillance culture that he developed in there and some other, I look at um, some, some uh, really interesting academic research showing the CIA, um, uh, research done by economists, not by me, but showing the CIA benefiting from coups. Um, <laughs> you know, making uh, making investments or going short on things before before things happen. So look, looking at all this, and then a lot of the book is uh, individual FBI files or CIA files of uh, often famous people, sort of looking at uh, the political surveillance, uh, primarily of the people on the left, but not but not only, uh, and the the history of it. And and really, what I'm sort of getting at in there is we don't know what the new surveillance technology is going to be. It will only get better and better. But we do know the uses that to which it'll be used because that's been very consistent. Um, and those are political uses, uh, using using it. Um, yeah, yeah, using it on members of the, both the American left and the American right of people who are out sort of beyond the edge uh, to to harass them or worse. Yeah. I see. Have you have you like with with that in mind um, in your research, you're you're doing F Freedom of Information Act request and, and examining source documents. Have you found many examples of that, just like very heavy handed surveillance being done on kind of dissident members of the right um, and left almost equally or? Uh, uh, more I would, say, to the left the I right would say not on the right to nearly the extent of the left. I mean, uh, you know, when I when I started, um, I was just using the Freedom of Information Act to gather documents from the FBI and CIA and other other agencies on sort of I was interested in anthropologists who may have been spies and things when I started. But from the FBI, I kept getting these huge files, like six or eight hundred page, thousand page files on anthropologists in the 1950s who were working on political racial equality campaigns. And Hoover was going crazy on them, the FBI on them, and and they were all accused of being communists. Some of them were, right? There were some who were communists or socialists, but lots of them were just sort of New Deal Democrats who, you know, for all of anthropology's faults, and it has lots of them, it's always been really clear about what race is and isn't, that, you know, race is this social construction, that uh, it has nothing to do with our capacity, right? Our capacities are from social opportunities and things like this. I mean, since like 1903, anthropologists have had very good understanding of, of race and the politics of race. Uh, and so you had, especially students of Franz Boas in the 1920s and 30s and 40s that were working to get rid of, uh, you know, redlining, that were working to integrate schools, that were um, showing up on campaigns for, uh, you know, Scottsboro Boys and things like this. And, and of course, the Communist Party was working on those things, too. It certainly wasn't the Democrats. The Democrats were Dixocrats, right? They they didn't want to lose the South. They were they had racism as part of the party. And so all of these anthropologists uh, during the McCarthy period uh, were tormented by the FBI. A lot of them lost their jobs. And in fact, that was really the first book on this I wrote. I wrote a book called Threatening Anthropology, uh, you know, McCarthyism and the, the FBI uh, hounding activist anthropologists. And I had no idea about any of this stuff. So I found, uh, oh, by far the left has been <laughs> harassed, uh, uh, especially while engaging in legal activities. Um, that's probably the biggest difference. The right doesn't really come under focus until they start engaging in illegal activities. But the the left, a long, long history of people advocating for basic things like gender equality or racial equality, um, they get tar they you know they've been targeted as uh, in the you know forties, fifties, and sixties as communists, uh, and still now as you know troublemaking anarchists and things like that. So. Yeah, I would, 
I would say from what from what I found, it's by far the left more than the right. That's fascinating. That's that's fascinating. I'm I'm curious how like how did you come into delving into freedom of information act based you know how did you kind of like go into that i was always interested in the history of anthropology my you know i did a dissertation where uh i did field work in in egypt uh in rural egypt in the fayum uh in 1989 and, and 90 uh i studied irrigation there just for traditional anthropological research but I, but I had a background and an interest in history of anthropology and you know I think I just read some article in Rolling Stone about the Freedom of Information Act and just started writing letters and and when I first did it I did it wrong you know uh, it's very simple to do you you identify a federal agency there are also state sunshine laws depending on your state for doing things but any federal agency except the IRS and uh Homeland Security you can't file with them. You can file with the National Security Agency. They won't do anything, but you can. Uh, and you just write a letter and you say, I am interested in this, maybe an organization, and you describe it, and then you wait. Uh, you can do it on individuals, but there's the Privacy Act. The Privacy Act says, you can't get my file. I can't get your file while we're still alive. But, but once you're dead, your privacy rights die with you. So um, and this is what I, when I started, I didn't know this and I would just ask for things and they'd say, you, you can't do that. Yeah. Um, and all you have to do is send an obituary or some sort of death notice with it. It's a very simple letter. You don't, they're really not magic words. And now they're very good online. If, 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 you know, uh, people watching this, listening to this, uh, if you just Google, you know, FOIA request or FOIA engine, F-O-I-A, Freedom of Information Act, uh, engine you'll go to a site where you just fill in the blanks and you you send it off it doesn't cost money uh it can cost money well that i should say with the fbi state department uh department of defense most agencies department of energy it doesn't cost to do the search the cia does want to charge but if you can demonstrate or claim that you're doing this for the public good which just means you're going to share what you have with the public, you can get a fee waiver um, on there. So uh, it's a very simple process. When I started, I I just heard, I'd seen some strange things when I was in the Middle East. I, I started off in Yemen, uh, back when it was North Yemen, uh, and throughout the, throughout the Middle East. And everyone knew these great or weird stories about anthropologists uh, and you know, intelligence community things. I just wanted to see what I could find. And I did hundreds and hundreds of these requests and it can take a long time. It can take years uh, to get a file. So you don't want to be waiting. <laughs> you, know, you want to have other things to do. Uh, but in the end, I got a massive uh, treasure trove of documents. Um, you know, right now in my, my back room, <laughs> should bring the show you the mess in the back room um i've got thirty thousand uh pages of of freedom of information act files that over the last 30 years um i've collected and used for this for this research that's a, that is a trove indeed i played around with the freedom of information act request a little you know process a little bit i i requested a few so i only actually got one and it was I had a friend, a university buddy of mine who passed away, but I had a feeling that he was under. Make sure I suspected that like myself, him, and like everyone in our social group were under surveillance. So I figured, well, if I request my own file, I was being probably unduly paranoid. You know, it's like that might tip them off that even there's something interesting about me. You don't want to do that, so. He passed away, and I'm really interested in whether they were, you know, surveilling him. So, yeah, I request it, and I found it interesting. I assumed that the FBI would have. Let me find it. At first, yeah, I was at George Washington University uh, mm. in 1993, and then later transferred to the University of Cincinnati for personal reasons. I 
moved from DC, you know, to Cincinnati. But um, you know, at, at, at the time, you know, this this is GW, so you know, there's there's a major engagement with with the State Department, with you know, a lot of GW graduates going to federal positions and so on and so oh, forth. Yeah. But also, mm. it's a very politicized campus in many ways. So yeah, I I was surprised to find out that from 1993 to 2000, they didn't have anything on this particular friend of mine who would, you know, would he would seem to be a very high profile. He was he was a Muslim. He was very um, socially and politically active with various groups. He was just kind of a bridge and worker. He was, you know, going between many different groups. Um, and he was a uh, teacher. He was a teacher assistant for. Uh, a professor there, Syed Hussein Nasser, who was a very famous um, professor of uh, Islamic studies. He, he's of Iranian origin. And um, long story short, though, nothing, including no incidents in which we were just hanging out on campus and people were just taking photos of us from like 20 or 30 yards away, just trying to discreetly not be noticed. And I would notice them out the corner of my eye and the camera would disappear. Back before everyone had cameras in their pockets. But no, I was very surprised. There was nothing until the fall of 2001. Oh, man. Yeah, it's interesting. The surveillance started. And him, his, his roommates, you know, there's, you know, there, there, are, there are actually a couple of individuals who, you know, one is a professor himself and wouldn't want to mention his name in public. But I found it interesting that just accidentally in this surveillance, because even though names were censored, I could tell who these are. It's like fifteen hundred pages worth. Oh and my gosh. It was it was a doorstopper. But the interesting thing was the uh this the special agents who were doing the surveillance, like towards the middle of the file, and I thought that I read the whole thing. You could tell they were getting very poor. You know, the, the reports that there's nothing going on here. There's this, you know, some plumber came to repair something in the apartment and said that he saw a terrorist activity. So, you know, this FBI you know, would get access to the apartment under a pretense, you know, pretending to be like a cable repairer. And um, he would look at these. No, it's a DC Metro era map. These guys are students living in some. <laughs> it's, it's like, the orange the orange line the, the yes, center the, of the terror network yes the terrifying <laughs> orange is the orange curl the orange <laughs> line that's worse than the red line but you know, it's just interesting uh, the beer can make speak you, you could tell that you know, you know like, there's nothing here there's nothing. And eventually the surveillance stopped around like, 2004 so it was but uh, I never had success. You know, two really different people. Like, are you familiar with Carrie Thornley? That the name. No. Um, have you heard of Discordianism? Oh yeah. Carrie Thornley was was an individual like associated with the beginning of the Discordian uh. meme in San Francisco, and he had a he had the interestingly enough. Brief notoriety because he was uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's bunkmate when they were in the Marine Corps. And prior to the JFK assassination, Kerry Thornley uh, wrote a very good novel featuring Lee Harvey Oswald before there was actually, you know, there was just this history. And he just, this guy that he was bunkmates with. So after the assassination of President Kennedy, Thornley came for intense scrutiny, and he found it rather amusing. And um, you know, he, it just found him to be an interesting character. So I, and he was associated with the whole counterculture thing, you know, very early on, the beginning of Putin's race. So I just figured, you know what, this probably is someone that's, that the FBI is under surveillance. I'll just request his file. I got nothing back. And a few other historically interesting individuals. So I, 
I uh, I wasn't sure if my request writing chops were sufficient or if I was just fishing for stuff that didn't exist. But it was fun. I actually thought it was kind of cool to do it. Yeah, I've, it I've found, and, and again, I've, I've lost count of how many. It's got to be well over 800 you know requests i've made um my my secret is to just sort of forget about it <laughs> i just i launch them out and then you know something will come i leave myself a note like why did you request this you know uh for some of them because some of the names i just like i'm not even sure by the time you know if it's four years later um so i've sort of left myself a register to do it but yeah it's it's not uncommon uh for them to say they don't have something and then someone else will make the same request and they'll get the thing so i i tend to think it's just bureaucratic incompetence rather than anything personal uh i think it's it's just sort of sloppy work uh that's that's going on because i would i would be surprised uh if thornley doesn't have some sort of file out there i mean if you're writing a novel uh you know about lee harvey oswald or, or knew him before uh, before the assassination, I would think your name's going to show up somewhere. I, mean, I would think so too. But you know, you you have these branch offices. It's like with any federal agency. There's particularly pre digital. You know, you have paper files and microfiche and microfilm, and yep. just, I'm sure just locating stuff is it's a bit of a pain. Um, so I, I'm uh, just to kind of segue a, lo a little bit. I, I'm curious about your latest book, the um, Cold War Deceptions, uh, the Asia Foundation and the CIA. I, unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to order it yet. It's in my um, Amazon cart, but I looked at the, the front matter, they, there's a little preview and it seemed fascinating. Yeah, this is a, a book about a CIA funding front that was exposed in 1967 and stopped taking CIA funds. It still exists now. It, it runs on State Department and other funds uh, that are there. I don't think there's any CIA tie other than its roots that are there. And I first came across documents from it maybe maybe a dozen years ago, uh, working at the doing research at the Smithsonian Institution. Um, there were the records of the American Anthropological Association was there. And I, I knew that it, it had at one time been a, a CIA organization CIA, with CIA ties. And I found these files in the American Anthro Association records showing that they had this program where if you were a student, a graduate student, or a professor from pretty much any Asian country, not China, uh, most the majority of the Asian countries. Uh, and you were an anthropologist or studying anthropology for $1, you could get a, a free member, you know, a membership to the American Anthro Association, which, you know, today is like $300 or something like that. And you got a journal and all these things. It was, it was a scholarship and hundreds of people would do it every year. And what I found in this in these files was the Asia Foundation just jonesing on the association to try and get addresses for everyone who had it and or find out if they were going to meetings and things like that. So that that made me a little interested. Um, and once once the New York Times exposed him in March 1967 as being a, a as taking CIA funding, the association uh broke all ties with them. And I found all this correspondence on this. Well, then later I figured out that uh, the, the longtime president, this guy named Robert Blum, uh, had left his papers at Yale University. And um, when, I, when I give talks, I get invited to talk at universities all the time. And when I, when I do, if it's a rich university like Yale and they want to uh, you know, give me a stipend, I'll say, do you own a hotel? <laughs> and a big university like that does. And I'll say, you know, keep the money. Can I stay in the hotel four or five days? I want to hit the archive. Because uh, a lot of my research, I, I rarely get grants because I'm studying funding foundations. And that's usually not something people want to fund. So, uh, but I do just fine. Uh, so I found the papers of this president and they were incredible. And th there, it was not a big collection. It was only maybe three or four feet 
long, uh, but there were all these reports and they were very clearly sort of soft intelligence reports that this, this president was doing. So I, I collected a lot of those documents, started working on that. And then I found out that the Asia Foundation had deposited a huge amount of their records. Uh, clearly they'd been purged, but at Stanford University at the Hoover Institution, uh, like 480 linear feet, which is a huge amount of documents. So seven years ago, I had a sabbatical. I was able to get funding from Hoover to go down there and work through this collection. It, I didn't touch every piece of paper in that larger collection, but I touched a lot of the good stuff. And so what I do is uh, tell the history. Other, other people have written really great books about funding fronts, right? The funding fronts are where the CIA pretends to be a normal like a uh, grant organization, a foundation or things like that. But they fund things where they want people to do their work for them or things that are of interest to them. And uh, there have been really great books, uh, you know, uh, Francis, uh, forgetting her middle name, Stoner. Uh, oh, yes, a... Francis Stoner Saunders. The, the Thank you, Saunders. World. Thank you. I was forgetting the last yeah. name, The Cultural Cold War, where she, a fantastic book. Paper. Yeah, she looks at how uh, uh, artists, for example, were were funded, uh, abstract impressionists were funded uh, secretly by the CIA just because their art pissed off the Soviets, right? They didn't, it was, it was too wild. Um, literary magazines were funded. There's this, and there are these great books that look at who was funded and how it impacted what went on. What I do is I do sort of an autopsy of a funding front, because this is the only one where we have, that I know of, where we have the documents left about how did it work? Because um, they had huge employees, these huge budgets, um, and they their primary funder was the, the CIA from 1951 till they got caught in 1967. And you can tell how this sort of cultural hege hegemony, how uh, everything from conferences they would fund where you, you you know i found correspondence where the director is suggesting maybe oh it's a, a you know 1965 1967 conference on the vietnam war maybe we shouldn't have these leftist people come and talk what if we had these other people come so this is the funder saying this and it changed the conversation right it changed who got funded it changed what went on so um i had I had some trepidation doing this book because I'm not a scholar of Asia, right? I'm a, I've, I've become a scholar of the CIA, which helped me a lot because I could recognize names as they showed up in places uh, that I knew from other contexts. So I had to learn a lot about, I had to learn a lot more Asian history than I thought I would, uh, thought I would ever know. Uh, but, but by far, I'm not a, a, an Asian scholar, but I'm, I'm in that book, I'm able to show uh, how the CIA was able to turn academics' heads uh, and artists' heads, and you know how they were very successful uh, in in doing this, uh, and and I learned an awful lot about after they got caught in 1967. There were a lot of fronts that got exposed uh, by the press. You know, Ramparts Magazine, this great you know investigative journalist magazine. Uh, expose the National Student Association as being taking CIA funding. And that just opened the dam. Uh, there started to be all of these revelations. And there, I found that there were these commissions to study what they called CIA orphans. Like what would happen to all of these fronts that were getting exposed? And they sort of designed the modern um, way of funding things. They channel it through the State Department. They channel it through, uh, you know, other. They get Rockefeller to to come and do their part. Ford Foundation to do that. And Ford and Rockefeller were really worried about this, uh, about what would happen from the the fallout from this. So, um, uh, to me, it was uh, I I learned a lot about how these found how these funding fronts uh, worked. Uh, and sort of the the history of how significant they were in sort of shaping a lot of intellectual activity in Asia and in the United States uh, in the 50s and 60s and sort of what the fallout from that was. That's fascinating. And it, it was sound to me as if um, this kind of work just fortuitously, you were, you were able to come across these archives 
it just might actually kind of be a bit of a an archetype if it could be applied to other use cases and, and considering yeah. yeah it's i mean that whole era is fascinating to me like i was born in the very early 70s and so like the world i was sort of born into it's kind of the world that was shaped then it's sort of transitioning to another one and the political culture has shifted and the Cold War is no longer there. But you know, I grew up listening to older activists. You know, my dad was very political. Um, and, you know, people describe these kind of things, but there are rumors. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's like I would hear you describe, oh, yeah, I love it. You know, it's the CIA, they would have these fronts on the campus and this, that, and the other. You know, it's just rumors, and people would just kind of speak about it. But now it's serious history, it's serious research. And it's, it's a fascinating look into how uh, how our government was made and, and, you know, the cultural clout that it potentially had. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious, and as far as like in in researching this particular subject and researching the um, the Asia Foundation, like um, just from the book matter, you know, from the feet matter from the book description, it's something that struck me is um, you point out how you basically had a covert operation in which most of the employees who are directly employed have absolutely no idea who they were really working for. And I'm wondering, how common was that back then? And um, it, like, like how compartmentalized were these, I guess, subterranean connections and um, relationships? Yeah, that's... That's a good question. Part of it is unknowable, right, in terms of the specifics. Um, for the Asia Foundation, probably at least half the employees and, and like staff members probably knew. Uh, but they're just the tip of the iceberg because you have people who are working there and then you have people who are funded by it. You have students who are receiving scholarships. You have uh presses that are you know translating books uh you you know you you had some employees that were sending in reports that would become essentially intelligence reports and things like that uh you know how common were these fronts that's a that's a good question you know the 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 only way they were exposed uh was was by accident in the early 60s i think 63 there was a a Texas member of Congress named Patman, who was holding hearings with an Internal Revenue Service. And he had some high level IRS employee giving testimony before Congress. He was trying to expose communist organizations, right? He was out hunting commies and he found some irregularities. And he said, there are these, I think it was uh, four or five uh, foundations. He goes, these, these don't make any sense. We look at their paperwork. It doesn't add up. And, and these in open session. And the IRS guy says, I would prefer to not answer that in open session. He goes, you have to answer that in open session. And the guy goes, okay. Those are run by the Central <laughs> Intelligence Agency. And so in the early 60s, this gets exposed. And then, and, and it got printed. You know, the New York Times wrote about it. The Washington Post, it was, it was out there. And then people forgot. They just, they didn't go any further looking into it. And it wasn't until Rampart, uh, you know, this real great investigative, short-lived Bay Area magazine um, dug in and just started to use the little bit they knew from that to sort of work out and try and figure out what does a funding front look like? Well, it looks like usually a name on an office door with nobody there. Um, you know, there, there are or the pass through the organization, the, the funders that come out. So they were able to get tax records and sort of work from there and, and do it. And I think we probably know most of who these funding fronts were. And I think they probably ended most of them in the 1960s because they didn't need to, because most of this stuff could be done really openly through the Ford Foundation and, you know, 
Carnegie Foundation and, and Rockefeller. Um, they, they were funding the sorts of things. They worked in collaboration because uh, if you look at a lot of who the directors are, have been of, of these foundations, they're often rotating doors in and out of the State Department or, or CIA. So they're when they're in those positions, they're able to sort of direct funds in ways uh, that are useful to state. Have you, um, I'm curious, uh, in the world that we live in today, in uh, the year 2024, you know, 23 years after 9-11, and, and goodness, I say that. Wow. It's been 60 years, really, since, like, the beginning of the 1960s. Is it, I didn't really, really process like how much time has passed by. But, you know, it's it's interesting that you know, these cultural shifts that, that have occurred. I'm curious, the degree to which the degree to which an intelligence agency connected foundations and cultural institutes and magazines and things of that nature influence the conversation um influence the discourse and, and culture all the time like you know we hear in the case of Aether Foundation but just one of many from the 1950s to you know the, the 1960s uh your research your more recent research into the weaponization of anthropology within the decades closer to us after 9-11 I'm wondering, do you see any resonances? Do you see evidence um, of similar engagement of, I guess, for lack of a better term, our intelligence establishment into cultural and intellectual institutions of present day in ways that would shape our present day conversations and discourses or do you think that is more of a cold war the, the kind of what francis stoner saunders described in the world of art and, and so on and so forth and what you examined with the asia foundation is this more something that's kind of this a chapter of history that has passed and it's interesting to look at or do you think there's still ramifications today i think the stuff that uh Francis Stoner writes about, I mean, that was sort of wild, secret strings being pulled, right? This this sort of stuff. Um, I don't think they have to do that anymore. I think it's all out, out in the open. Um, you have, you know, in, in weaponizing anthropology, I write about these campus programs, the Pat Roberts Intelligence Scholars Program, the Intelligence Community Scholars Program, things like this, where intelligence community somewhat openly uh, is embedding itself in, in campuses. And after everybody got all scaredy pants after 9-11, it's just, it's normal. It's part of, uh, it's just a social fact that, that these are things we quote have to do. Uh, and there's a generational change of people who have grown up in the post 9-11 world and they, they just accept it. So I don't think you have to be sneaky in any sort of way. Uh, I think America is a completely successfully militarized country uh, where, I mean, the most dangerous things you can probably do is to talk about the military uh, as unnecessary to the, the degree that it is. So they don't have to do it. Uh, they won, right? It's this is this is a completely militarized country, and people don't have to hide uh, the in, the intelligence. I mean, you you know, Washington Post. Uh, it's been a while, maybe five, six, seven years ago, did a a huge expose, a, a multi part sort of enterprise story, where they talked about the number of people, and I forget the number now, who have uh, a secret security clearance or higher, and. It, it went up not like by four times after 9-11, it went up like a hundred times where there's this entire industry of people that are out there, which is where Snowden came from, right? Snowden did not 
was not working for the CIA. He was working for some private company that was getting rich off of all this stuff that's out there. So uh, that's one of the reasons I don't think these these fronts are there. They don't they don't need to be. The, <laughs> we have been conquered. <laughs> We've been conquered. The uh, the state has won. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is right. That's a, that's a fascinating way of looking at it, and I, I confess I, I never I didn't really think of it that way. I guess you know I, in my mind I'm used to thinking to I'm used to thinking of these things as being more contested than they probably are. But then again, I think you probably live in an echo chamber. And it's like you you converse with people who are like mind. You read things that I mean, try to read a spectrum. You know, I try to, I try to engage people in sources on both the left and right and the center. And I try to sort of spread my fingers out. And, um, but yeah, you know, I guess we all wind up in echo chambers eventually. And, you know, people are grumbling about, ah, these, these folks, were they really spying on us? And this time, and it's like, well, no, this is actually quite out. And, you know, it's not that controversial. Hence, you know, Snowden. Yeah. It's, it's interesting how both, Julian Assange, who's recently been released, and Edward Snowden, how, when, if I reflect on it, how shocking those revelations were to many people at the time, but then it, it really does seem like the, the conversation moved on. And it's just sort yeah. of... Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, we're being spied on. All right, you know, let's we'll go back to playing Angry Birds. <laughs> No, American Ninja. <laughs> watching American Ninja. I'll, I'll watch the American Ninja rewind because at this point, I don't even know if it's still on the air. It was fun when it lasted, though. Well, I um, I don't want to get too much of time. This, it's been a fascinating conversation for me, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I don't know if you would have any interest in the future, but would, after reading Cold War Deceptions, I would certainly like enjoy reflecting on it, and if you have the time and schedule, I would love to talk about. Let's do it. I'd I'd love to do it again. This has been a real pleasure. It's been a real pleasure for me too, as well. Well, um, with uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Price, and I will leave. Um, I'll leave a, a couple of Amazon links to the books in the description under the video. And um, is, or, or is, is there anything that you are there any sources and resources that you would like to leave with someone, you know, in the audience listening who might be interested in further exploring both both your work and the themes that you explore? Uh, you know, I guess. You know, feel free, feel free to Google David Price Anthropologist. You'll find all sorts of things, you know, including, uh, you know, I did three books on anthropologists and intelligence agencies with Duke University Press. And one of them, um, I was able to work it out. So it's it's done on a Creative Commons uh, license and it's free as a PDF. So Cold War Anthropology is if you just Google that. Uh, I think there's a link to it on my Wikipedia page, or used to be. Uh, you can just get to the PDF. So who doesn't like a free book? That's that's definitely the way to go. Actually, yeah, it is. It's uh, at archive.org. I just clicked on your Wikipedia page here. And yeah, it's, it, there, is a, there is a link there, Duke University Press 2016. Yeah. So great. Well, again, thank you so much for your time, and it's been a pleasure and honor. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you, Kamal. Take care. You too. Take care.